right, we'll finish up our last uh, some last few quotations from Idiot Tordei. Uh, this is on page 35. Uh, we saw last time we, Pius XII says that it is neither wise nor laudable to reduce everything to antiquity by every possible device. Meaning that there were people who had that idea. He would not be reproving this otherwise, as we noted before. We listed some of the problems that uh, he's pointing out, certain trends. It's clearly, this is number 63, and that left-hand column on page 35, Clearly, no sincere Catholic can refuse to accept the formulation of Christian doctrine more recently elaborated and proclaimed as dogmas of the Church under the inspiration and guidance of the Holy Ghost with abundant fruit for souls because it pleases him to hark back to the old formulas. So, uh, he's saying, uh, well, you see, he's setting up a, a parallel here between older formulas of uh, say a profession of faith which have been superseded by more recent ones in this, uh, as we can call it, a true, not in a modernistic sense, but in a true sense of a development, a further elaboration of the, the dogmas of the faith, of the truths contained in the divine revelation uh, by a successive uh, progression of clearer, more explicit uh, dogmatic formulas. Anybody who studied De Revelazione knows that the, a dogmatic formula is not to be identified absolutely with the uh, dogma itself. In other words, a, a dogmatic formula certainly expresses one that has the approval of the church absolutely is correct. It's, it's perfectly in accordance with the truth, perfectly in accordance with divine revelation, but it's not necessarily the most explicit possible way of, 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 uh, of formulating that, of expressing that truth. That it is possible to have successively more thorough uh, enunciations of that same truth. <coughs> so, Pius uh, XII says here that it is not permitted, obviously, when the church gives you this is what you are to believe, this is more explicit than what is, was be, uh, prescribed to, to, be, to be professed before. Uh, now you must profess this, and maybe certain things which were uh, on which there was, concerning which there was room for legitimate difference of opinion and continued debate. Certain points perhaps have been settled. There's no more room for debate on that. There's the authority of the church has seen fit to settle this, and now it is settled. And now you must hold this. You are not free to reject the more recent formula and go back to an older one. No more can any Catholic in his right senses repudiate existing legislation of the church to revert to prescriptions based on the earliest sources of canon law. Just as obviously unwise and mistaken is the zeal of one who in matters liturgical would go back to the rites and usage of antiquity, discarding the new patterns introduced by a disposition of divine providence to meet the changes of circumstances and situation. So some might point to this to say, well, you, you, you fall afoul of this. You are in, in applying epikeia to uh, certain of the uh, certain rights approved by Pius XII. And one thing, one thing as we pointed out before, uh, that that would be a very strong argument if Pius XII were still Pope, but the fact of the matter is he has not been Pope since 1958. There's a little distinction to be made there. That's an understatement. Obviously, that's a huge distinction. He has not been Pope for many decades by now. But also, actually, it's quite the opposite. Once you understand the people at whom these uh, words were aimed, when these words were in fact promulgated, <coughs> Not only does it not prohibit us from applying Epikeia, as this clearly was never intended to exclude the application of Epikeia to ecclesiastical laws, this is addressing a normal situation in which the bottom line of all this is you must follow the laws of the church and be submissive, uh, sub, uh, not only submitted to, in fact, but also in spirit submissive to the authority of the church. But yeah, once you understand that this was actually directed at the liturgical movement that ended up producing the Novus Ordo, it does quite the opposite. It proves that there are grounds for applying Epikeia, that the mind of Pius XII was obviously, uh, could not possibly have been, we know that anyway, but this is just one other indication that he had no intention of laying any groundwork for false worship, which is the Novus Ordo. And that ultimately, though, we'll see also this with unmistakable clarity, that the people who were formulating all of the uh, Novus Ordo wards, for lack of a better term, uh, they all, uh, the, uh, those liturgical reforms during the reign of Pius XII, all those who engineered them, 
as Drupal is well signed on the dotted uh, signed on the dotted line. But the, all those who formulated it themselves definitely saw this as the groundwork, as Bonini himself says, as the bridge to a new city where modern man can feel at ease. We'll see those we'll see those quotations here in a bit. So not only at, uh, some might try to use these quotations against us, but correctly understood, these quotations actually do quite the opposite. They prove that. What we're doing is entirely justified and correct. So, this way of acting bids fair to revive the exaggerated and senseless antiquarianism to which the illegal Council of Pistoia gave rise. More often referred to as the Synod of Pistoia, an 18th century schismatic gathering of all of the Jansenists and all of the generally horrible people in Europe uh, that was really a miniature Vatican II. And really, Vatican II, in a sense, was not the first Vatican II. It was the biggest and most widespread, the Vatican II. And, this, and it spread everywhere, of course. But it was not the first thing of its kind. It was not really, Vatican II was really not original in, in any way. The, the novel thing about it was, this was supposedly the Catholic Church embracing all of that. Everything which had always condemned before. The Vatican II was not, in a certain sense, uh, it sounds funny to say it, but uh, Vatican II, in a sense, was not the first Vatican II type thing to happen. So, it likewise attempts to reinstate a series of errors which were responsible for the calling of that meeting, as well as for those resulting from it, with grievous harm to souls, and which the Church, the ever-watchful guardian of the deposit of faith, committed to her guard by her divine founder, had every right and reason to condemn. In every measure taken, then, that proper contact with the ecclesiastical hierarchy be maintained. Let no one arrogate to himself the right to make regulations and impose them on others at will. Only the sovereign pontiff, as the successor of St. Peter, charged by the divine redeemer with the feeding of his entire flock, and with him, in obedience to the apostolic see, the bishops, whom the Holy Ghost has placed to rule the church, have the right and the duty to govern the Christian people. Consequently, venerable brethren, whenever you assert your authority, even on occasion with wholesome severity, you are not merely acquitting yourselves of your duty. You are defending the very will of the founder of the church. So these quotations that we just looked at from this encyclical, uh, of course, cover a few pages in these notes, but even so, keep in mind, this is really just, all things considered, a small excerpt on it. This is this is a lengthy encyclical, and uh, you do very well to read the entire thing. But all everything that we've given here is the only reading of require of it for this course. But there you see, there you see they, this obviously entirely correct and perfect. Uh, I can hardly improve upon it. Way of expressing uh, the the principles to be applied in obedience concerning obedience due to the Holy See. And, and all matters, and, and really, specifically, the focus here is on liturgical matters. And uh, keep in mind, yes, all of everything prior to Vatican II was all very closely regulated. Keep that in mind, that there was, uh, our, our situation might sometimes make, make, make uh, certainly the laity, but even ourselves sometimes uh, inclined to lose sight of the fact that prior to Vatican II, really nothing in the church was left to the imagination. Everything was regulated in, a, in, a, in, in some way, uh, which is actually uh, it just speaks to the, the assistance of the Holy Ghost, of course, and the, the wisdom of the laws of the church, that everything was regulated as it needed to be without, however, being oppressive in any way. It was just one example of how closely everything was regulated with the rules governing when incense was permitted at a Misa Cantata. So you can find this, uh, liturgical authors talk about it, rubricists give the rules for this. They explain that uh, the bishop of the diocese, the local ordinary, had to give his permission for incense to be used at a Misa Cantata on any given day. I mean, he might give a regular permission that it be done, I say, every Sunday, every parish church that has a high mass that is a Misa Cantata uh, may use incense at that mass or on big feast days. The bishop could, uh, the diocese could, uh, could, could allow it on certain days at his discretion. But in order for him himself, for himself to be authorized for that, he had to receive certain faculties that were called the quinquennial faculties from Rome itself. These were faculties that were granted for five years and could be renewed every five years, and they were frequently renewed. That was just a regular thing. 
But the point is that in order to even to permit that, the bishop of the diocese had himself to be authorized to permit it uh, by faculties that were granted to him by Rome, from Rome itself, uh, and which had to be renewed every five years. So uh, just uh, one example of how closely everything was regulated. So, now we move on to some quotations from Father Chikata. He, of course, did a tremendous amount of research on all of this, and we're not even looking at the, uh, the, the things that happened during the reign of John the Twenty-Third or Paul the VI, uh, the promulgation of the Novus Ordo Mise itself. Father Chikata does go, indeed, does go into all that. He did all the research on that as well. Our focus here still being the reign of Pius the Twelfth. We're just going to look at the changes, liturgical changes, that occurred during the reign of Pius the Twelfth which definitely, undeniably, in retrospect, we can say, certainly, were leading towards the Novus Ordo. And then we're not saying, as we've said before, it always bears repetition, that uh, we're not saying that any of this was evil in itself. That's impossible. But we are saying that we have ample reason, now is what we're demonstrating, ample reason to apply Epikeia to those things. And you'll see, just some of the things, hopefully we'll get to them today, but uh, some of the things that uh, Pius XII uh, did were, uh, that some of the changes he made that were moving in that direction that were engineered by Bugnini would, if we were to employ them, would affect drastically just the way that we sing the office. So you know, even for seminarians who have not, uh, of course, do not have to say recite the entire office every day, do not have to, of course, have to or, uh, before ordination, you're not saying mass, and things that uh, would affect you far more where you're doing those things. But even just what we do, singing prime vespers and compline every day. Some of these changes would affect what we do here drastically, were we to, of course, employ those, if we were not to apply Epikeia to those. So we'll see that, just how, how different it would be if we were to employ some of these. So, Father Chikata says in his work, in his uh, own work, his book entitled Work of Human Hands, which, by the way, is, uh, that, that's, a, that's a term used in the Novus Ordo Mise itself, uh, referring to the, the gifts at the offertory. And Father Chikata you know, repurposed that to, uh, to describe the mass, the you know, mass of Paul VI itself. So in November 1947, as we have seen, Pius XII published his great encyclical on the liturgy, Mediator Dei. Despite his condemnation of the errors and deviations of the liturgical movement, archaeologism, so that, that obsession with going back to antiquity, that's archaeologism, lay priesthood, false notions of participation, etc. So you see, for one thing here, Pius XII addressed and condemned other errors of the liturgical movement that we just don't have the time to address. If we had the time, we would go through that whole encyclical. It's great. It cannot be too highly recommended, but we don't just don't have the time to go through it. The left in the movement saw the discussion of the liturgy that the encyclical provoked as an opportunity to advance their program. So look what Bonini said about it. Uh, Annibale Bugnini, in, uh, the, in his own work, his own memoirs concerning uh, the formulation of the Novus Ordo Mise, and uh, notice the title of that book, notice what he calls it, The Reform of the Liturgy, 1948 to 1975. 1948, when Pius XII had been Pope for nine years, nine years into his nearly 20-year reign. Only halfway through, Bugnini marks the beginning of the move towards the Novus Ordo. So, and notice what Bugnini says about it, this is perfectly absurd. In his encyclical Mediator Dei of November 11th, 1947, Pius XII put to the seal of his supreme authority on this movement, which was now to be found everywhere in the church. What he did was condemn the errors of it. But this is what Bugnini says further, the liturgy had entered upon its true course, that of pastoral concern, and was thus returning to the ideal it had had in the beginning. So you say here is somebody who is at the very forefront of this liturgical movement. Uh, clearly they did not give up any of their ideas, despite the fact that they were condemned by Pius XII. So they tried to, oh look, the Pope just approved of everything we're doing, when in fact he condemned the, their entire operating system, so to speak. But obviously, yeah, this is an example of the, the, kind, the way things worked during the reign of Pius XII. Condemnations came down that were perfect but they weren't enforced. So the reforms that would follow from 1951, this is Bonini himself, the reforms that would follow from 1951 to 1960, most of that being the reign of Pius XII, were primarily concerned with this pastoral aspect. 
you see why you look at the reign of Pius XII as being the threshold of Vatican II to a very great extent. The norms, strictures, and laws of a pastoral liturgy were formulated during those years. Yeah. Just reading Bonini's words here. People throughout the world and at all levels of society became interested. The most perceptive among the church's pastors saw in the liturgy the means best fitted, sometimes the only means, for bringing the faithful back to the practice of Christian life or for deepening that faith in them. Only two years before Mediator Dei, there was another event of considerable importance for the liturgical reform, the publication of the new Latin version of the Psalms, which the Pontifical Biblical Institute finished in 1945 under commission from Pius XII. This work, which had been brought to completion by the tenacious determination of the rector, father, later Cardinal Augustin Bea, remember brought from Germany to Rome by then Cardinal uh, Pacelli, helped to ripen in the Pope's, Pius XII's mind, the idea of a reform of the entire liturgy. The new Psalter would be simply the first building block in the new edifice. And so now if you, you see one reason why we don't use that, it was always optional technically in any case, and many people didn't like it from the very beginning, uh, but it was also used and if you, you, so you can still find books that have it. And when you read it, if you ever come across it, you know it right away. It's different. It's notably different from the Vulgate, which we use. And uh, it's, there's something you have, to, you have to be familiar with the Vulgate and the aspects of poetry that it still has. And you can put, put them side by side. And there is something uniquely and undeniably ugly about the prosaic manner in which the Bea Psalter was formulated. It's just there is no aspect of anything poetic about it at all anymore. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's workbook Latin. You find, I mean, you, 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 you'd expect to pick up North and Hillard or something and find it written in exactly the same way. It's just, it, it, it's terrible. That is, it has a, an undeniably ugly aspect to it. And it's uh, it, not to say it's unorthodox or necessarily inaccurate. Uh, there might be different schools of thought on different points how exactly this verse should be translated. Uh, there's nothing contrary to faith in it or anything like that. It's, we, we could not call it a corruption of the substance of the Psalms, but there is an aspect to it that you, know, you have to have some familiarity with the Psalter, liturgical Psalter as a whole, and you have to have some familiarity with how Latin works in order to, to, to appreciate it fully, but uh, yes, you if, you've ever, if you're used to the Vulgate, you could not possibly use this Bayos Halter. So, Bugnini himself, uh, in addition to that, uh, Bugnini himself lists that, the, the formulation of that Psalter, that translation of the Psalms into Latin, and he went back to the Hebrew. Uh, Bugnini himself, as Bayo went back to the Hebrew, uh, Bugnini himself lists this as a very important step in moving to the Novus Ordo. I mean, it doesn't say that in those words, but it's obvious. In retrospect, it's obvious, obvious what he's talking about here. And you see also clearly from Mediator Dei, Pius XII had no intention, uh, which we can tell from other, other, uh, from other arguments in any case, he had no intention of forming the Novus Ordo, obviously, uh, and that he was, remember, these people are all part of his inner circle. Bea, remember, was his confessor, had brought him from Germany in order to be his confessor, specifically for that purpose. So he was someone who was a very much in his inner circle. And so there, uh, you know, who knows, of course, we can't know what exactly was said to Pius XII in private, but we, it is, you can tell, as we saw from the earliest career of Pacelli as a young priest, that he was very impressed with anything that presented itself, anyone who presented himself as intellectual. Remember, he was involved in astronomy clubs when he was a young priest, right after his ordination. He was already involved in that sort of thing. So clearly what was happening here is he's being fed this by people in his inner circle, being sold on this as being a good idea, while clearly not knowing where this was leading. That, that is morally certain from many indications. Yes? Uh, Father, um, where did this, uh, under Pius XII's pontificate, where did this notion it seems to me that they're saying that the Latin Mass isn't very pastoral. It, you know, it doesn't 
Yes. Where did they come from? Uh, no, from their modernist minds, from their modernist fever dreams. They imagine that, yes, that the, 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 the sacred liturgy approved by the church for many centuries is somehow lacking in like, ability to teach the faith or something, which is a perfect absurdity. So yes, uh, everything that these people are saying, it's all, it's, well, it's really, ultimately, the thing, how could they say something so nonsensical is that it's because they hate the mess. Because they hate the Catholic faith and want to get rid of it and every expression of it. And they're modernists also, remember, so they have no problem uh, lying about their agenda. They have, no, they have no problem employing deceit where it suits them. And not, not accusing every single person who could have possibly been involved in it of these things. But generally, that was the un these were the underlying motives. And so, yes, it's, it's every bit as bad as it sounds. Yes? Because I was wondering about it in the sense that, I mean, the church is already... Um you, you can find all the missiles that have the English and the Latin. Exactly. So um, there, there's, they have no, they have no case to make here. They have no leg to stand on when they say these things. Uh, but it's it, the Novus Ordo to this day. They say similar things. Uh, you come, might meet people who uh, you're trying to get them interested in the traditional Mass, and so I just I want to know what's being said. I don't like the fact that it's in Latin. And you tell them exactly that. Like you can very easily get traditional daily missiles that have everything explained to you in very simple English, they still, they just don't want it. Uh, yes? Sorry, Father, not to go on a tangent for too long, but uh, you just reminded me as well. Um, so, for example, the medieval peasants, I mean, they, surely they didn't really understand the Latin, yet they still mm -hmm. attended, right? Yeah, obviously, yes. Uh, so, uh, however it was explained, yes, they, obviously, books back then were very expensive. They weren't being, probably not being given daily missiles at the time, but they were obviously instructed in everything. Uh, though, again, what how exactly form that took, we'd have to investigate that. That's a subject of further historical investigation. But no, the, 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 the sacred liturgy of the church is set up precisely to be, uh, in, in one, according to one of its aspects, that is one of the things that it does very well, exactly does teach the faith. Not to say that if people aren't there, that somehow the liturgy of the church has failed, but that is one of the reasons why, in a sense, it's all being configured the way it's configured, and it does that very well. I mean, definitely, it does it much better than the Novus Sordo does. Uh, yeah, that teaches people nothing. In fact, it destroys, that, that truly destroys. Anybody who may have had the virtue of faith and goes to the Novus Ordo uh, will either end up abandoning the Novus Ordo or losing the virtue of faith. Or if you try, try to, trying to put those two together will result in nothing but misery, for sure. So, now some people who, yes, might go to the Novus Ordo still have the virtue of faith, but it's in conflict. They're going to the Novus Ordo is in conflict with their trying to hold on to the faith. Because the Novus Ordo was trying to root it out of them, trying to destroy it. Uh, they're trying to hold on to it, and that's a constant struggle. You can see those Novus Ordo conservatives are, are miserable to a very great extent. So, yeah, we could go on about that for a long time. Uh, but yeah, all of this, in other words, the, the principle to be applied to all this here is it quote gratis asseritur gratis negatur. That which is gratuitously asserted is gratuitously denied. You have to, if you want to assert something, you have to make a case. You have to prove your, your assertion. If you don't prove that assertion, it remains just that, an empty assertion. And someone who says, you know, someone could come in here and say, the moon's made of cheese. And you would say, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> End of story. You have no proof of that. All right, I can just deny that. I can deny that just as easy as you can assert that. Right, if you don't present any proof, then and it really, in a sense, there is nothing to deny, and that's the point. Is that if you've made no effort to build a case, then no one need make any effort to shoot it down, because there is nothing to shoot down. And that's the principle to be applied here. This is nonsense, yes. They're, they're, what they're saying here, that the, the church, the liturgy, the sacred liturgy of the church, of course, they're thinking primarily of the mass itself, that that's somehow lacking in these aspects is just an absurdity. And that's really, that, that's the long and short of that. So our project, for, so down now at the bottom of the left-hand column on page 36, a project for liturgical reform, or more accurately, liturgical codification, was later found among the papers of Father Pio Alfonso, a Benedictine, who taught at the College of the Propaganda and was a consultor of the Sacred Congregation of Rites. The document is dated the Purification of Mary, 1942. So I'd say this, that in itself, the idea of putting everything uh, in concerning the sacred liturgy under one 
you know, let's say under one cover would not be a bad idea. That there, there are a great many things that are left up to authors to describe, to, to, to lay out. Uh, there are certain questions that, uh, that really should be settled. Everything, should, there are things that should be clarified. Maybe, uh, say, rubrics that may have been superseded by later decrees still remain in, 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 in liturgical books. Uh, that it would not be a bad idea to have the ultimate ceremoniali romanum. That would not be a bad idea in itself. But you see, the modernists would, yeah, they'll use absolutely any means at their disposal to achieve their ends. And, yeah, they're, that's, that's how leftists work. So how revolutionaries work. They will take advantage of anything they possibly can to achieve their end. Just think about today's political leftists. They have absolutely no qualms of conscience about doing and saying all the most horrible things and being absolutely shamelessly corrupt in the way they go about everything just to attain their end. That's all they care about. Just are they attaining their end? If they're attaining their end, as far as they're concerned, it's good. Anything else that gets in the way is necessarily bad as far as they're concerned. So these liturgical modernists... And they're much more subtle than today's political leftists, for sure. But their operating system is essentially the same. That they will latch onto anything and say anything they have to in order to push their agenda. And so they might latch onto the idea. People, there might have been some idea, okay, it'd be good if we were to put everything together, codify everything. That doesn't sound like a bad idea. So they'll latch onto that and they'll say, oh yes, we're, this, that's exactly what we're doing here as they're going off uh, in another direction. They might, they might do that with the Novus Ordo, but... Uh, they say my, they, their claims they, they might end up being true in some sense at some point, but they're, they're using it as a vehicle for something sinister. So, looking at the PN Commission, as it was called, the idea of a reform acquired definite shape when the historical section of the Sacred Congregation of Rites, the organization best equipped for work of this kind, was assigned to undertake it. Its members were to prepare a basic plan that should serve as a guide for a discussion of the various problems with which a special commission was to deal. In October 1946, the vice-relator, a general of the historical section, Father Joseph Leu, an Austrian redemptorist, began the drafting of a plan. The commission took about two years. 300 copies of it were published as a posizio, number 71, of the historical section, under the title Memoria Sulla Reforma Liturgica. So a memor uh, so it was a kind of memorandum on the subject of liturgical reform. While the approach taken in the memoria was quite general, two points were somewhat developed, the liturgical year and the divine office. For the rest, it was explicitly stated that studies of other points would gradually be prepared. Four that were of greater importance were published in the form of supplements to the memoria. The first of these had to do with the ranking of feasts. The second supplement contained the judgments and observations of Fathers Capel and Jungmann and Monsignor Righetti uh, on the memoria. Uh, the third and most important supplement brought together the historical, hagi hagiographical, and liturgical <laughs> material needed for the, a reform of the calendar. It had two parts. The first part reproduced the calendar, then used in the Church of the Roman Rite, along with other liturgical anniversaries that might be of interest on each date. The second part, which was a kind of alphabetical dictionary of feasts with relevant liturgical, historical, and hagiographical information, was intended as a basis for the composition of a new calendar. And in fact, it was used in preparing the calendar of the Pauline Reform. All of this, 1948, 20 years almost before, or even more actually than 20 years before the Novus Ordo Mise was actually promulgated in 1969, at nine years, halfway through roughly the reign of Pius XII. The fourth supplement contained the results of the consultation completed in 1956 and 57, also during the reign of Pius XII, at the end of it, but still during, of the Episcopate on the reform of the Roman breviary, together with the conclusions drawn from these results. Meanwhile, on May 28, 1948, a commission for liturgical reform was appointed. Its president was Cardinal Clemente Micara, prefect of the Sacred Congregation of Rites, or perhaps to check that prefect or president, or in, in some sense, uh, 
in, in charge of it, but um, I seem to recall that the Pope is technically the prefect of the congregation, but I have to check that. Its members were, it's, oh, um, the fact check, Bungini there perhaps. Its uh, members were, you have, have all the, uh, the, the members listed of these, of, of this commission. Notice some of the names who are on it. Yes, you have a arch, uh, obviously an archbishop, Father uh, Fernandino, uh, Ferdinando Antonelli, uh, the Father Joseph Lo that we mentioned before, Father Augustin Bea, SJ, Rector of the Pontifical Biblical Institute, Father Anibale Bugnini, editor of the Ephemerides Liturgice, who was appointed secretary, a position he held until the commission was dissolved when the conciliar prepara preparatory commission was set up in 1959. So they, they had it. all of this groundwork being laid during the reign of Pius XII. So one of those earliest questions we answered, or we asked at the beginning, which we've brought up repeatedly since, how is it that the Novus Ordo Missae was promulgated just a little over 10 years after the death of Pius XII? Well, it's because it was in the works for more than 20 years prior to that, more than 10 years prior to the death of Pius XII. The first meeting of the commission was held on June 22, 1948, at the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy in Piazza della Minerva, where Cardinal Micara, recently created a cardinal, was then living. The other meetings took place in the afternoon, either in the apartment of the Cardinal President or in the meeting room of the Congregation of Rites. So yes, this seems to indicate, yeah, I'll have to verify that. I was going by memory, talking about that yesterday. But it seems that, uh, that, it's, uh, that the, the Pope is the prefect, technically the head of the Congregation of Rites, but you know, because you know, there's a lot of work to do that he cannot see to himself, he appoints a, a Cardinal President, someone to preside over it, a Cardinal who takes care of the administration of that on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, who is not technically the prefect, and the Pope is the prefect, because it's just so important, the work that it does. But I will verify that. So in the beginning, not everyone grasped the importance of the issues or realized that the work would be long and demanding. So you see that this is something really being very stealthily smuggled in, so to speak. That uh, as uh, again, modernists had learned a few lessons during the reign of St. Pius X and subsequently, that they, uh, they had really been hit hard, obviously, by all uh, the uh, censures laid down by St. Pius X. Uh, they realized they had to be subtle. And you see, by now, decades later, they have collectively mastered the art of subtlety uh, in every way. And they're, they're stay, they've learned how to sneak things in, how to stay under the radar, so to speak. So the Cardinal President thought the work might take a few months or at most a year. So the President, the Cardinal President of the, Pref of, of the Sacred Congregation of Rites, has the impression that this, this will do them, some, something that will take a few months to a year. They didn't know this would be something that would result in the Novus Ordo Misae a couple of decades later. The disillusionment began when Father Bea gave his opinion on this point. A revision of the scriptures for liturgical use would take at least five years if the criteria adopted for the Psalter were applied universally. The disillusionment was completed when the majority accepted this forecast and added that five years was an absolute minimum. In the 12 years of its existence, June 28, 1948 to July 8, 1960, the commission held 82 meetings and worked, and notice this, in absolute secrecy. It's very stealthy, in other words. And this is a, something, of course, that was set up uh, under Pius XII. So secret, in fact, was their work at the publication of the Ordo Sabati Sancti Instarati at the beginning of March 1951 caught even the officials of the Congregation of Rites by surprise. That is, the 1951 uh, putting of the Easter Vigil back at night and also, and yeah, we'll see that later on, uh, mentioning by way of afterthought, oh, and also these rubrics that follow these revised ceremonies for, for the Easter Vigil. You say there's something, there, there are rats, in other words, we're, what we're seeing right here is the activity of the rats in the walls, and nothing's being done to stop them, obviously. And they, they've taken great care that nobody should be alarmed so as to stop them. The commission enjoyed the full confidence of the Pope, 
who was kept abreast of its work by Monsignor Montini, and even more, on a weekly basis, by Father Bea, confessor of Pius XII. You could just imagine what they were telling him. And there's absolutely no way they were telling him, oh, by the way, we're reintroducing modernism here, and we're going to introduce an invalid mass in a couple of decades' time with, on the basis of this. There's no way they were telling him that. But again, he, he enjoyed, the, the commission enjoys his full confidence. He's not monitoring it personally, clearly, if that's the case. He's not, he's not scrutinizing its, its activities. He trusts fully the, the commission. And this is Bungini himself. There's no, he, he would have absolutely no motive to lie on this point. Bungini himself says we were pretty much just allowed to do whatever we wanted. And who, who, who kept the Pope informed? Well, Montini, future Paul VI, and Bea, Father Bea, future uh, modernist, uh, leading modernist at Vatican II. So really we can see that the people who perpetrated Vatican II were Pius XII men, in the sense that he set them up. They would never have been in a position to perpetrate Vatican II and everything else that the Vatican II religion entails had he not put them in position to do so, had he not provided the springboard for them, so to speak. This is Pius XII we're talking about here. He was the one who let all this happen. You see why history will probably not judge Pius XII very kindly in the grand scheme of things. Thanks to them, the commission was able to achieve important results even during periods when the Pope's illness kept everyone else from approaching him. That speaks pretty well for itself. It must be honestly acknowledged that the work accomplished, despite the limitations of personnel and business, was enormous. So now you have a, at least a slightly nauseating self-admiration on the part of Bugnini here, that we really got a lot done. We were really great at what we did. You can't deny that. So a little bit... Uh, a little bit exasperating there, but in any case, move on from that. Almost all the liturgical books were revised, including the ritual, which was corrected and set in type but not published because the Vatican bookstore was afraid it would not be able to sell it with the council on the horizon. So also, again, they knew there was a council coming. Which is why we can call Pius XII's reign, as we've alluded to before, the threshold of Vatican II. Also surprising was the pastoral sense, and that's never good. Never hear it. Whenever you hear that adjective used by a modernist, that's never a good thing. Also surprising was the pastoral sense shown by the PN reform, despite the fact that the commission was composed exclusively of scholars. Its success in this respect was chiefly due to Father Joseph Leu, a man of extremely flexible and versatile intellect, who was capable of devising a whole range of concrete proposals from which the best model could be developed. The first, the first fruit of the commission's work was the restoration of the Easter Vigil, 1951, which elicited an explosion of joy throughout the church. So such is Bugnini's claim. It was a signal that the liturgy was at last launched decisively on a pastoral course. You see why we don't use it. The same reforming principles were applied in 1955 to the whole of Holy Week, and in 1960, with the Code of Rubrics, that's under John XXIII, to the remainder of the liturgy, especially the Divine Office. So you see, in the minds of Bugnini and company, the beginnings of this took place during the reign of Pius XII, flowed very naturally to John XXIII and Paul VI, to the Novus Ordo, promulgation of the Novus Ordo in 1969, and subsequent uh, further add-ons and, and the revisions and so forth until 1975. To them, this was all one big process. Two years later, the new typical editions of the Breviary and the Roman Pontifical were published. But once the Council was announced and new reforming currents of thought exerted their superior pressure, the Johannine, so it's refer referring to John XXIII, the liturgical renewal lost a good deal of its energy. So saying that the only thing that caused any loss of momentum here was Vatican II itself. And during which, remember, John XXIII, it was not really an act of the council, but it was during the council uh, the, at the beginning, early on in it, John XXIII was still alive, and therefore fairly early on still, 
that St. Joseph was added to the canon of the Mass. Something we didn't talk about when we covered Roncalli specifically. We went on the whole long excursus on Roncalli. And the reason is that that was something he did when he was supposedly Pope, not something he did during the reign of Pius XII. But remember that that was, in a sense, cracking open the canon of the Mass. And there was, for a long time, there was this idea, uh, which, uh, and, and, and a very wisely maintained idea, I should specify, that you just do not touch the canon of the Mass. Say, uh, Pius IX, as I recall it was, was asked to put St. Joseph in the canon of the Mass. And his response was, I can't do that, I'm just the Pope. In other words, you just don't, you just don't do that. The canon had not been touched in any way since the reign of St. Gregory the Great. You just don't touch it. And even St. Pius X, who, of course, he's the one who, who uh, enacted the very, very generous indulgence of looking up at the host, the sacred host, and the, the child is containing the precious blood at the consecration of the Mass, and saying, my Lord and my God, this gives a very generous uh, indulgence. The celebrant of the Mass is not to say that vocally, not even move his lips at all in, in that moment. He's to say it mentally. The reason being, you don't add anything at all to the canon of the Mass. Not even you know, with the idea of gaining an indulgence by doing this. You just don't do it. Uh, so that, that is the, the dedication that many popes, popes throughout the centuries have had to maintain the canon of the Mass exactly as it is. And who was it that had the idea that maybe we should deviate from that? John the Twenty-Third. Let's add St. Joseph into the canon of the Mass. With the idea, we had to do, oh yes, we need to do something for St. Joseph. As though St. Joseph weren't, was, had not been historically honored sufficiently in the church. With a feast in March, March 19th, and then a whole octave, uh, uh, the solemnity of St. Joseph after Easter, uh, with a whole octave accompanying that. Um, St. Joseph mentioned, again, every time you have the suffrage of the saints, such as we had uh, yesterday at Vespers, uh, had the lauds today, anyone who recited lauds today, of course, recited that as well. Um, uh, every time every, the, the Leonine prayers after uh, low mass, St. Joseph is mentioned in that. You have Leo XIII laid down the, in the rosary devotion that part of that should be the recitation of the prayer to St. Joseph. Now, obviously, St. Joseph has been honored very highly in the church. And the reason that St. Joseph is not in the canon is because the, well, the idea is that uh, the canon has, is, con contains only New Testament saints. Yes, you do have mention of the sacrifice of, of Abraham, but the listings of saints given, these, those dedicated listings of saints in the canon of the Mass, are, are all New Testament saints. Which is why, actually, uh, there is, there's some debate as to whether uh, St. John the Baptist is mentioned at any point, specifically during the prayer of the Nobis Quoque Peccatoribus prayer. It's not that there was one, no, the Nobis Quoque Peccatoribus prayer has another listing of saints. It's debated... Uh, whether one of those is St. John the Baptist or not. There's a mention of, there are more than one St. John mentioned in the canon of the Mass. And it's, it's debated as to whether any of those is St. John the Baptist. And you can make a very strong case that it's not meant to be for various reasons, but probably the strongest point in, uh, in saying that it's not meant to be St. John the Baptist is that St. John the Baptist belongs to the Old Testament. That's the reason why, in fact, you may have noticed, that on the Feast of the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, which is a double of the first class with an octave, and throughout that octave, the credo is never recited. At least, you might have the credo recited on some days that happen to fall within the octave of St. John, but not on the feast itself, certainly, and never because of the octave of St. John. And something else to keep in mind here, uh, a bit of background in case you're unaware of it, that uh, throughout an octave of a feast, uh, which has uh, the credo recited on the feast itself, the credo is recited throughout that feast, or throughout the octave of that feast, even when it, there's, uh, you wouldn't do it because of the rank of the day. So you might have a day within, that, uh, uh, a day within the octave that's, say, only a semi-double. Say, today is a semi-double, for example, the Feast of St. Raymond, uh, Raymond of Pignafort is a, se a semi-double. You don't recite the credo. The celebrant of Mass does not recite the credo today. But if it's a semi-double within... A day within the octave of a feast that does have a credo, you recite the credo because of that. If it's a, a, just a, saint of a, a feast of a saint falling within that octave, the credo is still recited. It's called in the, in the, in the Missal, the note is given, Ratione Octave, by reason of the octave, because we're within the octave, an octave of a feast that requires it. And that feast of St. John the Baptist does not have the credo, and nor does his octave, because he belongs to the Old Testament.
So that's a bit of a tangent, but you see that this was all in the minds of the modernists, all one very natural, in their minds, natural process. In fact, it was forced and artificial, but as they see it, all one grand process uh, from Pius XII to the Novus Ordo.